This okay, so good afternoon. Will now be recorded. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and so I cannot see the slides. So uh, uh, Ms. Briggs, I'll just ask you to advance and then uh, we'll kind of just periodically I'll check just to make sure we're all looking at the same thing. And, and so uh, uh, we'll adapt uh, accordingly. So uh, again, good afternoon. My name is Mark Gill. I am a civilian employee of the United States Coast Guard. Uh, I've been with the Coast Guard 40 years. I did 21 years active duty, a combined uh, period of different jobs, uh, most of which was spent at sea, the last three of which were spent on an icebreaker here in the Great Lakes working out of Detroit. The last 19 years as a civilian employee, I've been based here out of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, I manage the commercial shipping here on the St. Mary's River. And then in the wintertime, I have a team of folks that uh, oversee icebreaking activities for the Western Great Lakes. Um, the plan for today's presentation is to kind of give you a sense for the icebreaking work that uh, that the U.S. and the Canadian Coast Guards do here on the Great Lakes. <laughs> Mostly pictures. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, data to kind of fill in the gaps on, on the business side of things, the economics of why we do what we do, and kind of the historical background on what we do. Um, my objective here is to hold your attention for about uh, 50 minutes or so. We can go on a little later with questions. Uh, but uh, um, I'll ask you that uh, if you do raise your hand, I, I don't know that I can see it or not, so I'll trust uh, Ms. Briggs to kind of manage that side of uh, uh, the presentation. So the first picture here, you should see Great Lakes ice breaking. A couple of ships there on the left is the Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac, uh, and then on the right uh, is uh, the Roger Blau. Um, the next couple of slides, and if you'll advance the first slide, we'll see Mackinac. Next side, we'll see a 140-foot ice-breaking tug alongside a 1,000-foot ship, the Indiana Harbor, and the breaker is the Mobile Bay. Next slide, you should see a buoy tender in the foreground and then a lineup of ships in the background. And the first couple of slides here, just to kind of get us in the mood, if uh, you were here on the Great Lakes right now, you'd be looking out the window in largely open water. That's atypical for this time of year. Most of the time, we'd be breaking ice well into uh, April. Uh, statistically, we start breaking ice around the middle of December, and we finish that up around the middle of April. Um, this year, we started breaking ice the 21st of December, and we were wrapped up on the 26th of March. Next slide, you should see a nighttime picture. Should show uh, in the far ground there a, a, an icebreaker and, uh, and approaching a ship uh, that's, uh, that's trapped in the ice. The next one will be uh, a presentation of, uh, of our authority for ice breaking. i will start here with a brief presentation and, and kind of talk about how we draw our authority or how we landed on the mission. Um, the Coast Guard actually traces its history back to 1790. Um, and, and that time we started out as kind of the, what was called the Revenue Cutter Service. And it was the nation's tax collectors at the very beginning. And, and through the follow-on uh, couple of centuries, we've picked up a number of, uh, of missions, search and rescue most famously, uh, some law enforcement on the customs side of the house, um, environmental protection. Uh, we have a national defense mission. Uh, we have an inspections mission uh, where we inspect commercial vessels uh, for, uh, for various uh, statutory reasons. Um, and then we have a waterways management uh, mission, which includes uh, floating aids to navigation, fixed aids to navigation. Domestic icebreaking kind of falls into that. Now we landed on the domestic icebreaking mission um, was through an executive order. And I know executive orders aren't all that positive uh, or favorable these days, uh, but back in the day, that was kind of how uh, the president uh, kind of directed actions. And in this instance, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt back in 1936 directed the newly formed Coast Guard um, and said, here, we want you to take these Navy tugs and uh, we want you to uh, formulate an icebreaking mission whereby uh, we want you to protect the environment, uh, service ice-bound island communities, and we want you to meet the reasonable demands of commerce. And, and it's these, uh, these three components that uh, kind of help shape the mission uh, and, and, and currently how we, uh, we demonstrate that mission today. Uh, on the Great Lakes, we basically split the Great Lakes up into two tactical mission areas. Um, 
originally back in the, in the 30s and 40s when we first got the mission, it was kind of basically a first come first serve thing. Somebody raised their hand, said, I need an icebreaker and, and the Coast Guard would sail and try and find that individual uh, with the onset of radio communications, radar, uh, and then uh, later on uh, uh, what we call AIS, automated identification system or transponder technology. Um, we've been able to develop and, and kind of take the search out of this mission. And, and, and instead of a responsive, uh, we've gone into a preventative role. So if you look at the, at the split there, the eastern half of the Great Lakes is managed out of Detroit in partnership with our Canadian Coast Guard partners who base their icebreaking operations out of Montreal, Quebec. And then the eastern half, or excuse me, the western half of the Great Lakes is managed out of Sioux, Michigan. And so that component area is representative of the northern half of, of Lake Huron, all of Lake Michigan, and all of Lake Superior. Um, we partner with our Canadian Coast Guard friends. We'll talk about the various icebreakers that come to form and, and their capabilities here in a couple of slides. But I basically want to give you the front that we manage the Great Lakes in two halves. Uh, the reason for that is span of control. Um, if we tried to do it in one central location, or years ago we had four separate operations, uh, and managing assets amongst those four entities were difficult. Um, each of those tactical operations are named for the principal cargo served. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago we had uh, Operation Breadbasket, which was run out of Buffalo, New York, and it serviced the seaway area for the grain shipments that used to go through. Operation Coal Shovel is named for the 1970s and 80s coal shuttles that used to run across Lake Erie um, and was providing from the, the mines in the U.S. taking coal to the power generating plants of Canada uh, and then transporting things back and forth. Taconite, uh, another name for iron ore that used to shuttle out of the mines and still does uh, out of the mines of Minnesota across Lake Superior and down to the ore facilities, the steel facilities along Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, and uh, Lake Ontario. The other operation was called Oil Can, and that was based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they used to be principally managing the uh, refined uh, oil products that used to come out of Chicago and be distributed across the Great Lakes. And so the, through the decades, we've kind of uh, fine-tuned and, and centralized the operations into two areas, and those legacy names, Op Taconite and Op Coal Shovel, remain. Next slide. We talked about the phases of ice breaking. It's a seasonal operation. I mentioned ice typically begins to form and become problematic in mid to late December, and then usually starts to release its grasp and, and make uh, navigation a little easier uh, mid to late April. Um, we go to a seasonality of ice breaking based on the opening and closing of the Sioux locks and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, each year by law, the Sioux locks close for winter maintenance, and that closure occurs on 15 January. The locks reopen 25 March. The Seaway, not so finite. The Seaway will close typically around Christmas time frame, um, and then we'll open again around the 20th of March. The states slide a little bit. But the three seasonal phases there are built around ICES, uh, around the lock closures. So the winter navigation season is the period of time when the locks are closed, typically 15 January, uh, until about a, a week or two ahead of the 25 March opening. The extended navigation season is the period that ice forms up to when the Sioux locks closes. The spring navigation, or what we call the spring breakout, uh, starts usually about a week or two ahead of the lock opening and extends until ice is no longer an, uh, uh, a hindrance to navigation. Now, the reason we got to these terms uh, is from a 1970s year-round navigation experiment. Um, hit or miss was the uh, ability to move without ice breaking support, and, and the season on the Great Lakes used to be roughly 290 days. Um, it left the commercial mariner without a realistic time frame for operations, um, and it became difficult to try and schedule and predict when they could deliver cargoes, accept loads, uh, and move commerce around the Great Lakes. And so in an effort to try and, and, and create a, a more efficient and predictable system, uh, these date times were, uh, were agreed, upon, agreed upon and then codified and put into law. That's kind of how we landed today. Next slide. 
Um, we're going to go through our toolbox of icebreakers. Uh, this is a, a slide showing uh, a 140 foot ice breaking tug. They're known as our Bay class. There are six of these on the Great Lakes, nine in total across the Coast Guard inventory. Um, they're systematically capable of breaking about three feet of ice. Uh, we use that as a general reference. Can they break more than three feet of ice short, certain conditions and certain weather patterns? But as a general rule, they bake about uh, three feet of ice. Uh, the platform is, uh, is going into uh, its uh, 40th year of service. Um, the last six years, we spent uh, a considerable amount of money, we, the Coast Guard, uh, in retrofitting, uh, improving crew uh, hab habitability, uh, improving some of the electronics. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't have enough money to touch the engines on this platform. And so uh, they're, uh, they're a little long in the tooth when it comes to propulsion. Uh, the Coast Guard is in, a, in a, a period of development, looking for what the next generation of icebreakers will be. And uh, we're currently planning in a three to five year cycle of what the next generation to replace this icebreaker will, will be. But the 140 foot icebreaking tug, again, there are six of them on the Great Lakes. Um, they're stationed uh, in Detroit. There's two in Cleveland. Uh, there's one in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, one in St. Ignace, Michigan, and then one here in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Next slide, we'll show you the 225 foot icebreaking buoy tender. This vessel is not an icebreaker by design. It was uh, built with a little bit of extra capability to help it service buoys in ice. So it has an ice belt on the forward end of the ship, uh, but the, the stern is not reinforced. And so it has great difficulty in backing up in ice. Uh, we get our pound of flesh out of this platform, um, kind of a rented mule, if you will. Uh, she's 225 feet long. Uh, she's got a nice 50 foot square stern, 50 foot beam, so she cuts a nice track, uh, whereas the previous platform, 140 foot long and only 32 wide. Uh, so we, in order to pass a, a normal Great Lake ship, which is 700 feet by 76 feet wide, or the 1,000 footers, which are um, many more than the 1,000 feet long and 105 foot wide, you can see the math there that we have to do several uh, track runs in order to open up an opening in the ice to get these folks through. And, and so the idea here is the wider the, the beam and the squarer the stern, the nicer the track is. And you can kind of see that in the picture here. Uh, the buoy tenders are not icebreakers. Uh, they're ice capable vessels um, and their stern is exposed, which makes backing down in ice, as I said, very difficult. The next slide is a picture of the Cutter Mackinac. So if you uh, see the buoy deck there, and this talks about what is called the Great Lakes Icebreaker or the GLIB. Uh, the new Mackinac, if you will, was uh, commissioned in 2007. She was built right here in the Great Lakes over in Marinot, Wisconsin. Um, she is uh, a little smaller, 50 feet, uh, in fact, shorter than the old Mackinac and about 1,000 horsepower less capable. But what she makes up, uh, what she lacks in horsepower, she makes up in, in uh, multi-mission capability and, uh, and uh, navigation efficiency. Um, she's not, uh, she's not uh, a, a regular screwed boat or a, doesn't have a propeller on it. If you'll go to the next slide, the bottom two pictures there, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. The old Mackinac, twin screwed. The new Mackinac has what we call azipods. If you can kind of think of a, what a trolling motor might be, uh, the azipods are actually positioned in the direction you want the ship to go. So in this picture here on the bottom right, you would see the propellers facing aft. That's actually positioned to pull the ship uh, in, a, in a backwards direction. When she's moving forward, those pods are turned in the other direction and the propellers are forward, and that's pulling the vessel through the water or through the ice. Those azipods are trainable 360 degrees, and that means the vessel can move in any direction 360 degrees. Uh, it actually is quite effective breaking ice in the, going uh, backwards. Um, it also can move sideways. We have a maneuver where we call it a plowing maneuver where that vessel can actually move sideways and, and shove ice out of the way. Old Mackinac, if you think of her, she was kind of a sledgehammer. She would just pound away through the ice the new Mackinac is kind of like a surgical knife. 
Uh, she doesn't have the same forward horsepower or brake strength that the old Mackinac does, but she makes up for that again in precision and being able to maneuver. She can turn around in her own wake. So within her 240 uh, feet of length, she can spin completely around where the old Mackinac would take two and a half, three ship lengths to be able to turn around. So again, a gain in efficiency. Next slide, you should see four vessels. Uh, upper left-hand corner is another shot of the Mackinac. Upper right is a picture of our 140-foot ice-breaking tug. Bottom left is our buoy tender again. And then bottom right is a picture of the Samuel Risley. She's one of the two Canadian Coast Guard icebreakers that are stationed here in the Great Lakes. Um, the Samuel Risley and, and her partner, the Griffin. The Griffin is home ported out of Amherstburg, which is just south of Detroit. Uh, the Samuel Risley makes her home uh, out of Perry Sound, which is uh, about midway through Georgian Bay uh, on the eastern side of Lake Huron. Neither ship spends much time in their home port. Their, their duties uh, take them all around the Great Lakes. Um, but uh, you see the Samuel Risley spend much of her time in Lake Huron and Lake Superior, whereas the Griffin spends a lot of her time in Lake Ontario and, and Lake Erie. Um, Mackinac's capability in ice, about four feet. The buoy tender, about two feet. And so the bay class I said was three feet of ice breaking capability, Mackinac four feet and the buoy tender two feet. And again, I wanna reemphasize, that doesn't mean that's their limit, that's their general operational capability. We've had Mackinac in upwards of uh, seven, eight foot of, uh, of uh, wind road ice, very capable and very functional in that. Uh, but generally speaking, we limit her um, entering into ice that, that's four feet thick. Next slide should show Canadian bench strength. Uh, upper left, uh, you have the Pierre Radisson. Upper right is the De Grosier, and the bottom right, bottom picture is the Marthel Black. These are Canadian Coast Guard, what is titled medium class Arctic breakers. Uh, these vessels uh, spend their summer months uh, in the Arctic, facilitating navigation across the Arctic Circle to facilitate uh, US and Canadian interests uh, across the Arctic. In the winter time when the Arctic is impassable due to the winter conditions, uh, these vessels reposition to Montreal. Uh, they generally will work seaward of Montreal and then occasionally in the spring when the, when the Great Lakes requires extra effort, uh, the Canadian Coast Guard will bring these vessels into the Great Lakes uh, and they will assist us in our Great Lakes ice breaking mission. Uh, generally speaking, when we get ice that's uh, outside the capabilities of our local uh, breakers is when you'll see these come through. Uh, most recently, the De Grosier and the Pierre Radisson were in the lakes in 2018-2019 winters. Next slide. So you remember I, I mentioned the executive order and how we develop our, our, our service priorities for ice. Um, and so what has developed over the years is four priorities for ice breaking. The first and foremost of these four priorities is what we call critical incidents or uh, incidents of uh, national significance. And, and so search and rescue security kind of falls in. If an evildoer is gonna threaten the Detroit uh, International Bridge or threaten the Sioux Locks, we're gonna stop everything we're doing in the world of ice breaking and we're gonna move in on those uh, areas in a, in a security defense posture. Search and rescue cases occur. Folks uh, venture out onto the ice for all manner of things. Uh, each one of the icebreakers, US and Canadian, maintain an ice rescue team aboard. The picture on the bottom left shows uh, a, what we call our rapid deployable craft. Uh, it is an inflatable uh, vessel that uh, also has uh, a trolling motor of sorts. Uh, the ice rescue team is equipped with cleats and spikes and, uh, and gear that allow them to get uh, uh, dry suits, if you will, to get wet. And they will scurry across the top surface of the ice when they encounter a break, they'll use the craft to cross open water to get to folks that uh, have uh, succumbed to uh, uh, falling through the ice. Top left is a snowmobile through the ice. You can see a heaving line. And in the far ground, if you look, there's a black object on top of the ice. That's actually the rider's helmet. In this instance, the rider did survive, was able to get off the craft. Unfortunately, a lot of times that's not the case. Folks are bundled up in their gear. Um, they go through the ice. Uh, they generally will suck in uh, trying to draw air, pulling in water, and they can't get that helmet off uh, and generally will drown very quickly. Uh, in this instance, the, the, uh, the rider did get off. 
upper right hand corner is actually I don't know if you can see too clearly, but you can see uh, uh, the lights on top of a truck. You can see the tracks on the far ground, and in that instance, there was a, a vehicle a truck that was recovering a uh, an ice shanty. Uh, and uh, the father and son that uh, were in that vehicle uh, did not survive that event. Bottom right um, is uh, what we see a lot, and that's folks that uh, get out onto an ice flow, and the ice flow detacks, detaches from the shoreline, and, and then we end up uh, running uh, different uh, rescue operations to, to ferry folks back to the mainland when that happens. Uh, areas in, in uh, Lake Erie, southern Green Bay are, are popular where you get uh, – uh, tens, sometimes hundreds, even thousands of folks uh, that are out recreating, fishing, uh, snowmobiling. Um, we have uh, uh, international uh, uh, sailing events. They actually are on sailboats that run on skis. Uh, those are popular sports out on the ice. And, and so occasionally folks get out and, and deal with that. So that first priority of ice breaking is that uh, critical incident response that we talked about. Next slide. Should see a dark picture, and uh, you see a, a picture of Mackinac is actually backing down to the bow of the Masabi Miner. Uh, we've classified vessels that are trapped in ice uh, but are in need of emergent assistance. We call them urgent vessel assistance requests. Vessels get trapped in ice all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute there, but just because a vessel gets stopped in ice doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go up in, in the priority uh, realm. Um, Vessels can get stopped and, and it'll take us hours to move them. But occasionally vessels will get trapped in ice and that field of ice is mobile. Uh, either detached from the shoreline and there'll be miles of ice around a, a ship, excuse me, and that ship may be in danger of hitting a bridge or hitting another vessel. Or maybe they're drifting towards shoal water or shallow water, which would cause them to go aground and endanger the vessel itself. And in those instances, generally, they're not in the most favorable weather conditions, generally occur at night or when we have reduced visibility because of snow or daylight, lack of daylight. Um, we're going out to, uh, to either stabilize the situation, stop the vessel from moving, or at least hold them up until we can get better conditions and, and safeguard them. The next priority of ICE is what we call uh, Emergency community service requests or exigent is a fancy word for emergency. Um, flood control falls into that. And so here you picture of an ice jam that is formed in a river. This particular river is the Raisin River, which is down near Monroe, Michigan, just uh, off the shore of Western Lake Erie. These ice jams form and cause the water to rise back up and it threatens lives and property along the shoreline. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is uh, instructed by their mission statement to uh, manage inland flooding. But generally speaking, these calls for assistance, especially from emergency managers, they land on the desk of the Coast Guard. Um, and uh, we use uh, uh, our partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to manage these incidents. They have the laboratory, the technical expertise, uh, and the water gauges to determine what is uh, an ice jam and where an icebreaker can uh, come in to uh, support uh, relief. Very often, just breaking the ice jam will cause that jam to flow into a different lake location and we can make flooding worse. And so it's not just a matter of identifying the ice jam and sailing right in and breaking it up. Sometimes we have to do a little bit of study and, and figure out what's the best course of action. But in this instance, uh, you, you'll nose up to the ice jam, you'll uh, weaken it, and then uh, the pressure behind it will force an opening, and then you're able to relieve that ice uh, downriver. Island communities. So in the western part of the Great Lakes, we we oversee or we uh, we work with eight island communities that uh, that rely rely on some form of ferry service to get them on and off the island. Living on islands is a very beautiful thing. It leads to some isolation, and some folks seek that. Um, other folks have just grown up that way and have been that way all their life. Um, living on an island comes occasionally with a little bit of, uh, of hindrance. Uh, sometimes the ferry is just not able to run. And, and so that's when the hand goes up, especially over a prolonged period of time when food stores, uh, the ability to get medical supplies or, or fuel supplies, heating supplies on and off the island uh, may cause uh, an elevated uh, risk. And so that's the back to the mandate where we are to protect icebound communities. 
Coast Guard maintains a mission area there to protect those folks. And we've classified that into what we call emergency community response. The fourth priority of service, next slide, is what we call facilitating commerce or facilitate navigation. We probably spend about 90% of our ice breaking time in this category. Um, it's determining when an, uh, an icebreaker is needed to move vessels from one place to another, um, when uh, we can uh, wait for Mother Nature to have an opening, or when we're going to have to work with Mother Nature to try and create an opening to move these ships. We're going to talk about the commerce and the industry behind the winter navigation movements, um, but just a couple of slides here to kind of give you some action photos where you can kind of see uh, what we're doing here. So the next slide should see the forward end of Mackinac. You can see a tug barge in the far ground. Uh, in this instance, uh, we're trying to facilitate tug barge uh, movements on the Calumet River down near Chicago. Next slide, offshore of Chicago is uh, a barge pushing. Uh, these are grain barges. Uh, these barges typically are made for moving up and down the inland rivers, not usually on the open Great Lakes. Uh, this picture was taken last spring down off of uh, Indiana Harbor, uh, Michigan, um, and the Michigan City area along the southern shoreline of Lake Michigan. These tug barges will come out of the river systems, Illinois River System predominantly, down the Calumet River, and then they'll be frequent uh, the four or five different harbor uh, towns that are down there to move their products uh, closer to their facilities. Next slide. Uh, what's life in the government without a little statistics? Um, here, just uh, quickly to kind of throw some numbers at you, typically uh, our, our typical season is about four months in length, so about 120 days on average. The Great Lakes each year averages about 40% of the five Great Lakes being covered with ice. Um, we run about 3,900 hours in the ice. And, and we traditionally uh, run about 300 to $400 million uh, worth of product across the Great Lakes. 2014, uh, for those that might remember, uh, that was a significant, uh, it was the formulation of the term polar vortex, um, and the Great Lakes uh, was covered with 92% of ice. Uh, Lake Superior itself was 96 per co uh, covered in ice, uh, and that's unprecedented. Uh, we started breaking ice the first week of December that year, and we wrapped up breaking ice the week of Father's Day weekend. Um, and you can see the hours there. 2021 season, um, slightly below average. We did have an advanced uh, above average period, uh, percentage of coverage at one point uh, early February, uh, but that quickly uh, went, uh, went away with uh, the warmer uh, temperatures of late February and early March. So we only broke ice this year 95 days. Again, 21 December to 26 March. And, and you can see that uh, our need for service and our economic impact was much less because the vessels just didn't have to encounter the ice uh, that they normally do. Next slide, uh, economic significance. And I'll, I'll let you read these numbers while I kind of yammer on, but uh, uh, the principal cargoes that are moving during the winter season, iron ore predominantly, uh, we have a little bit of grain that moves in late December uh, and again in early April. Uh, those grains, mostly wheat, uh, barley, um, some canola, uh, those are coming out of uh, principally Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is the grain hub for Ontario and, and really the eastern part of Canada. Um, most of that product is railed to Thunder Bay and then loaded aboard ships and then shipped overseas. Um, coarse salt, um, principally for roads and, and uh, for public safety. Um, Many people don't realize that underneath the Great Lakes, uh, specifically Lake Huron and Lake Erie, thousands and miles of tunnels where uh, miners uh, take the salt that was deposited there after the uh, ice ages uh, millions of years ago, and they're mining that salt, and they bring it out of the ground uh, in Cleveland, uh, and most of it coming out of the ground in a town called Godrich, Ontario, which is, uh, if you look at Michigan as and the Lower Peninsula as a mitten, uh, it's uh, about midway up the thumb on the Canadian side of Lake Huron. But that, uh, that salt is brought out of the mine, loaded on ships, and then sent to places like uh, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, uh, Chicago, Green Bay, Milwaukee, 
and then railed and trucked to places all over uh, Ontario, uh, Quebec, and uh, the middle part of the United States. Some of that salt becomes uh, seasoning salt. There's Morton's terminals all over the Great Lakes. Uh, some of that salt gets there and then gets re refined and turned into seasonings. Uh, but the majority of the salt that's moving around in the coarse grade, grade uh, is, uh, is shipped and used in uh, various products for roadway safety um, and sidewalk safety and things of that nature. Next slide. Um, so people kind of wonder, what, what are we trying to do and why are we moving the commodities around the Great Lakes this is a general year. 2019 was the latest uh, year uh, available, but but here you see the millions of tons. And, and as I mentioned, iron ore is the principal commodity, um, and you can see grain mixed in the sand and the salt. But this is year round. Through the Sioux Locks, roughly three percent of this country's GDP goes through the Great Lakes. But more importantly, 55 percent of the Great Lakes, the eight states that surround the Great Lakes and the two provinces of Canada, 55% of those commodities are what's moving around the Great Lakes um, and, and coming through that locks. So you can see the importance of, of Great Lakes navigation, not only to the nation, again, 3% is, is, is a fair number, but to the Great Lakes states and the two provinces of Canada, more than half of those regional economies depend on Great Lakes shipping. Some comparative numbers here. Uh, Great Lakes uh, shipping has long been seen as the most economical and environmentally friendly way to move these bulk commodities. Again, limestone, um, uh, iron ore, they're dug out of the ground in bulk form. Iron ore is pelletized where it's combined and under pressure and, and combined with different minerals to, uh, to be further melted and turned into various types of, uh, of steel and, and other metals. Uh, but to look at, you know, the comparison from using thousand foot ships uh, or to smaller ships or to trains, or if you look at what it would take to move the, those 90 million tons by way of truck, imagine what the roadways would be like trying to move 42, 42 I guess it would be 4 million 200 um, uh, 20 ton trucks uh, around the Great Lakes trying to move all of that commodity. It's just not feasible. Next slide should so, uh, show a stockpile of iron ore. Um, so during, uh, during the fall, we're spending a great deal of time stockpiling iron ore. I mentioned the Sioux locks closing for a nine week period, 15 January to 25 March. So during that period, um, there's a stockpile of iron ore that the, the steel facilities along Southern Lake Michigan and along the Erie shorelines uh, that are using and drawing that down. So in the far ground here, you see this would be a November, December stockpile of, of iron ore. In the foreground is limestone. They use that limestone in the smelting process uh, to kind of uh, separate and, and keep the iron ore from fixing uh, on, the, uh, on the belts as they move through the refining process. But uh, again, in a short couple of weeks, you're going to go through that that stockpile. And if you go to the next slide, you can see a reverse picture here. In the far ground, you see actually salt. In the foreground, this is a storage bin that once was, you know, seven, eight, nine weeks earlier, full of iron ore. You can see the the mover and the and the trucks that are actually literally sweeping this up. And industry calls this cargo sweepings. And they push this up and they're scraping all the literally the bottom of the storage bins early March. Um, as they approach the reopening. The demand for iron ore and the demand for the products is that high uh, as we move into March, which kind of speaks to why we are so uh, urgent on getting things open up again in the spring. Next slide shows a picture of uh, an offload of salt. Just to kind of give you a, an instance, this is the port of Milwaukee and they're taking a delivery of salt there. Um, it's uh, uh, it's again, an ec economic way of an environmentally friendly way to move these bulk commodities around the Great Lakes. Uh, are we doing okay? Am, 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 are, uh, Michelle, I'm assuming where everything's good? Yes, Mark. Okay, 
Uh, moving on. So we'll click in and and this next picture is uh, if anyone follows Great Lakes Shipping at all, you might dial in to uh, boatnerds.com uh, or you might find uh, marinetraffic.com. There's a number of online websites that allow you to follow uh, the transponders that are fixed on board uh, commercial shipping. This is a snapshot taken 15 December. On any given day in the Great Lakes, you have 60 to 70 commercial vessels uh, that are trading on the Great Lakes. Between the U.S. and Canada, we have uh, 11 ice-breaking assets. The Canadians bring two to the, to the trade. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard brings nine. And remember, two of those nine are not really icebreakers. They're buoy tenders that break ice. So you mentioned, just to fill out the inventory, we have six Bay Class 140-foot icebreaking tugs. We have the Mackinac, and then we have the two buoy tenders. That's the nine. And then on the Canadian side, we have the Samuel Risley and the Griffin. Their capability is about the same, maybe a little less than Mackinac, certainly more than our buoy tenders, uh, but a little less than Mackinac. Uh, those two platforms are also a little long in the tooth. Uh, both are 35 plus years old, uh, and their Canadian Coast Guard is in the process of designing their replacements, but probably won't see the Great Lakes, join the Great Lakes icebreaking uh, mission until uh, probably late uh, 2020s. Uh, we're hoping to see them 2025, 2026. Uh, realistically, that's probably going to be 28, 29. But as I mentioned, 70 vessels vying for an icebreaker mid-December with only 11 to go around. Remember, I talked about service priorities. And the way we manage the, the icebreaking mission in the Great Lakes, who gets an icebreaker when, falls back to that service priority. So if you go to the next slide, you see our four service priorities there down the side. So when somebody asks for an icebreaker, we're going to evaluate, are you in need? Are you critically in need? Are you an urgent vessel in response? Are you servicing a community? Could be a ferry asking for an icebreaker. Could be a, a tanker servicing an island community with propane or, or heating oil. These things are going to determine a place in line. The final category, facilitating navigation, is pretty broad. And so on top of these service priorities, we also determine um, a place in line based on location. And so we'll go to the next slide, and you'll see a classification of waterway based on uh, Tier 1, 2, 3, and 4 designation. I'm going to give you an analogy. Think of snow removal for those in the country that deal with snow. You leave your house, you're going to leave your driveway, you're going to get on a side street, you'll go to a county road, and then you'll get to the interstate. If you think, with, it, let's say you have two feet of snow in your driveway, the state's plow truck is not going to visit your driveway. You're probably going to shovel that yourself. You may be buying a snowblower, or you might pay somebody with a blade on the front of their truck to come plow you out. If you look at the Great Lakes, Tier 4 waterways that's the private driveways. That's the facilities. That's the docks. These are privately held um, areas where the owner of that area is going to be responsible for cleaning that area or breaking the ice up so that ships can access that place. So much like your driveway, the government's not going to send a resource in there unless it's an emergency. Let's say there's a medical emergency at your house and the ambulance can't get to you. Maybe they order the county plow truck or a city plow truck to come in and gain access so that the ambulance can get to you. So in an emergency, you might see some, some action in the driveway or in this case, the Tier 4 waterway. The interstates are going to be Tier 1s. In the Great Lakes, the interstates are the connecting waters of the Great Lakes. So, excuse me, to get from Lake Ontario or uh, to Lake Erie, the Welling Canal is a primary area. To get from uh, Lake Erie to Lake Huron, you're going to use the Detroit-St. Clair River system. To get from Lake Huron to Lake Michigan, you're going to use the Straits of Mackinac. To get from Lake Huron to Lake Superior, the St. Mary's River. These are the only waterways that will allow mariners to get to and from, and so they have a higher uh, priority of service, and we designate those the highways of the Great Lakes. And so they're designated Tier 1, and they get the highest service priority by location. The government's going to spend the majority of their time breaking ice in the Tier 1 areas. 
Now, go back to the analogy. To get from your driveway, Tier 4, to the side street, Tier 3. In the Great Lakes, the Tier 3s are the federal waterways that surround the various port entities. So the Port of Green Bay, the Port of Duluth, the Port of Detroit, the Port of Cleveland, the Port of Sarnia. These areas, there's a federal waterway either managed by the U.S. or Canadian governments. They're marked by buoys. Generally speaking, the government is responsible for creating a safe path, i.e. cutting a track. And then the waterway or the port itself may have local commercial entities, commercial icebreaking providers that will service the waterway and provide escort assistance. Much in the way that when you come out in your side street, your city or maybe your HOA, your homeowners association is gonna hire a plow truck or maybe the city puts a plow truck and you exchange that for your tax revenue or your tax base and that's how that service is provided for. Much in the same in the Great Lakes is that way. So your tier three waterways, your ports that are maintained federally will have an icebreaker visit to cut track and then the local entities will vie commercially uh, to provide service. Tier twos are the areas that fall outside the ports. Generally speaking, these are the frozen waters of the Great Lakes um, or the bays. So as you leave the St. Mary's River to enter Lake Superior, you travel Whitefish Bay. To tr leave Michigan and go to the port of Green Bay, you're gonna travel the Bay of Green Bay, um, Maumee Bay, uh, Saginaw Bay, Georgian Bay, these large bodies of water that fall outside of the connectors or the, the, the interstates, if you will, uh, but they don't fall into a classification like a port. And so in these instances, there's a bridgeway of service. The government's going to provide track if a commercial entity wants to provide escort assistance in these areas, which is seldom. Um, but we do invite commercial interest if they want to come out and work there. And so go back to service priority and then the waterway classifications. And you can get a sense for based on what your need, the urgency of your need, and your location, the Coast Guard's going to kind of assign a priority. For those in the audience that ever walked into DMV and wondered where you were in line when you entered, either you take a number or you kind of just look around and figure out who's in line ahead of you. Sometimes you end up asking. Here in the Great Lakes, when it comes to ice breaking requests, we don't want the mariners having to try and figure out their service priority. And so basically we assign that priority on a daily, sometimes hourly basis, depending on urgency. And so on a daily basis, industry, the commercial entity, the carriers, the carrier organizations, they will communicate with the two Coast Guards and they will give us their, their planned movements for the day. And we will assign icebreakers based on those planned movements. So in the morning, generally speaking, we'll get by 10 o'clock uh, a plan for tomorrow's movements. And then we will set a plan for tomorrow. And then at night, we will convey that plan to the icebreakers. And then in the morning, we take the next day's movements. And we're always working in advance. We're scheduling the next day's activity or the next hour's activity or the next 12 hours. So the, the actual urgency, um, the uh, number of folks that are waiting online, the op tempo is dictated by, uh, generally speaking, the amount of ice, the thickness of ice, and the difficulty of ice going through. I know that kind of rambles a bit, but it, generally speaking, we want to provide the mariner with a predictability, a plan for movement, and then an efficiency of movement when they actually arrive. Next slide. How do we gauge the formation of ice? And there's three components to that. There's water temperature, air temperature, and snowfall. Next slide. If you look here at any given time between uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, the National Weather Service, and here in the Great Lakes uh, down at the University of Michigan, a NOAA-sponsored NOAA entity that's called GLERL, G-L-E-R-L, Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. These three entities provide a repository of information uh, based on water sensors that are out on buoys, satellite sensors that read the surface temperature of water, the motion of water, and in some instances actually takes uh, satellite imagery uh, of ice-covered waters that help us gauge temperature, formation of ice, um, and, and, and track those. 
Um, if you look at the Great Lakes and the history of, of our weather analysis, in the United States, we've been measuring temperature, air temperature predominantly, uh, only since 1888. We know the world is millions of years old. So if you look at the scale, 1888 compared to millions of years of data, we just don't know a whole lot about the climate. When it comes to ice measurement, we've actually only been measuring ice and studying ice since 1972. So on the Great Lakes, when it comes to evaluating ice, we know even less than we do about air temperature. And so each year we're learning more and more. And as our ability to program satellites, study the algorithms, and, and look at the various formations year to year, we're learning more about Great Lakes ice uh, with every year. But it's still a very basic and elementary science. Um, we don't know what we don't know. So when it comes to water temperature, we have sensors that give us that. This is a snapshot from early January that gives us uh, a scale on temperature. Next slide shows you uh, the evaluation on the same day of Lake Superior. Um, when you go to the next slide, you'll kind of see uh, this is a multi-year graph where the blue line represents the five-year average. In this instance, actually, it's, I think, a 24-year average. Um, my father told me never do math in public. I think it's 14 years if I look at it right, maybe a little more. But anyway, uh, you have a multi-year uh, line that gives you a general temperature uh, of, of Lake Superior. And then if you look at the red line, that's the current temperature. Now, what does water temperature do for us? If you take a glass of water and you put it in the freezer, take another glass of water and put shaved ice in it and put it in the freezer. The glass of shaved ice is going to freeze much, much faster because it's almost already to a solid, whereas the water, uh, the cold water, uh, will take a little bit more time. When you look at water temperature, air temperature, and snowfall, these are the factors that go into the formation of ice. If you've got cold, cold water and you add cold air on top of it and then add a significant amount of snow, you're going to create surface freeze much faster than you would with just water cold and then cold air over on top of it. So when it comes down to measuring uh, water temperature, air temperature, and if you'll go to the next slide, this is the Great Lakes average surface temperature into January. You go to the next slide, you'll see a picture of freezing degree day temperatures. Now a freezing degree day is a really simple process. You take the days high, the days low, and then in a comparative formula, you push that to freezing. So here's an example. Let's say today's high is 30 degrees, and then tonight's low is zero. When you do a mean temperature, you'll come out with something around 15 degrees. Now, if it's 30 degrees longer and, and, and zero degrees shorter in that period, your mean may adjust a degree or two either direction. But for the simplicity of the formula, I'll just tell you, let's say today's temperature average is 15 degrees. Compare that to freezing. We have made the equivalent of 17 freezing degree days today. Now, if you do that same mean temperature over a five-day period, 17 times 5 uh, will give you 105 freezing degree days. Now, in our 40 years of study in ice, the accumulation of freezing degree days, we've been able to determine the formation of ice. And when we get an accumulated freezing degree day count of 125 degrees, we typically see ice start to form. At 250 freezing degree days, that's typically when we see this ice start to move off the shoreline and hinder commercial movement. At 325 freezing degree days, that's when we start to see ice uh, forming inside harbors and sealing up harbors where it's creating uh, difficulties inside the port. When we get to 500 freezing degree days, we start to see that ice move outside of ports into the open waters of the lakes and the bays. And then at 700 and freezing degree days is when we start to see uh, those bays become a blocking. And we have a number of other metrics that allow us to determine difficulty in ice. The reason I point these out is when you look at the National Weather Service locally, you'll see that freezing degree. And there's another term that's out there, heating degree days. Um, and the commodities market with heating oil, propane, they're all driven on this heating and cooling or heating and freezing degree day count. And, and I don't want to get into the economics of that because 
that's outside of my uh, skill set. But what I will tell you is these numbers go into the cost and, and, and some of the commodities pricing that go on uh, across the, uh, the Great Lakes and, and in Canada as well. Next slide is a snapshot of January showing our snow count. Uh, really, our snowfall count uh, across the uh, Western Great Lakes this year was less than average. Um, I wasn't able to pull down the current uh, uh, the current snowfall count, but I, I am of the uh, of the understanding that we were at least 12 to 18 inches uh, across the area below our normal snow count. Now, what does that mean? Less snow typically means less ice. Less ice typically means uh, greater water exposure during the winter months. Greater water exposure leads to evaporation, and evaporation means lower water levels. For those who live around the Great Lakes, especially in the lower lakes, we've had a higher than average water level count. In fact, record water level counts uh, for the last five to seven years. Many shorelines in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are suffering where uh, we've got more water than we can hand. Lake Superior's been above average for the last handful of years, and, and so we've had to let a corresponding amount of water down into the Great Lakes um, and then eventually out of the, the St. Lawrence Seaway in order to balance uh, that water level. But you can only let so much water out of the Great Lakes uh, without ha harming the environment. And, and so snowfall has a contributing factor to that. So we should see water levels drop this spring into the fall. Typically in the spring, we'll see a little bump in water levels because of the runoff, the spring melt this year, because we've had less ice and, and less snowfall, we shouldn't see such a dramatic rise. And into the fall, we'll see those water levels uh, uh, seek uh, normal levels, I think. The next slide, if you'll see, is a picture of the Great Lakes. Uh, this was max ice coverage this year. Uh, the various colors kind of giving indication of thickness of ice, percentage of coverage. Uh, you'll see the Great Lakes ice total on uh, 19 February was 46%. Um, typically, our peak ice period is the third week of March. Uh, this year, we peaked in February. Uh, and by, we, by the time we reached the third week of March this year, we were almost uh, completely melted all the way across the board. Again, typically, we begin forming ice mid-December. And then we, uh, we get rid of that ice uh, mid to late April from a statistical time frame. Next slide. Um, this is a picture that comes from our Canadian uh, partners, the Canadian Ice Service. The green line represents 30 years of uh, average ice. If you kind of follow along the bottom, that's week by week coverage. The blue bars are percentage of ice across the five Great Lakes. So if you look across the top, typically we peak at 40% ice coverage across the Great Lakes. Um, if you look at the green line and you kind of follow that down to the week by week, you can see where I said peak ice is normally the third week of March. This year we peaked the third week of February, and you see the, the drop in ice percentage of coverage um, correspondingly week to week. So the beginning of the year, predictors, ice guessers, or forecasters thought we were going to have maybe a little closer to what is normal. You see in the early weeks of January and uh, in, or December into January, you'll see we were kind of tracking that along that line. And then um, early January, mid-January, we were well above normal temperatures. And so that uh, percentage of ice coverage just never grew. Uh, we kind of tried to catch up early February. We had a dash of Arctic air, and, and so we saw some freezing. Um, but the ice never reached its traditional thickness. And so when it started to warm up again in late February, early March, it, it didn't take much to uh, to dry it up. Next slide. Statistically, the big three winners, uh, 1979, 1994, and 2014, uh, each of those years uh, famous or, or infamous for uh, percentages of ice coverage. If you go to the next slide, a little easier to see uh, that bar graph there kind of gives you uh, the long-term average on the U.S. side. Uh, you see at 53%, when you factor in Lake Ontario and the Canadians, uh, you get a little drop in that percentage of coverage. But this is the U.S. factor. Um, and you can see the highs and lows of, uh, of what we've experienced. Remember, we've only been tracking ice in the Great Lakes since 1972. So again, uh, very little data when you go to the, the age of the Great Lakes and the age of, uh, of, of our climate study 
uh, specifically here in the Great Lakes. Next slide uh, kind of incorporates all five Great Lakes. The green line represents statistical average, um, and then the year by year kind of give you the percentage. Um, and you can see above there, and again, across the five Great Lakes, these percentage totals don't necessarily uh, add up to what we saw individually on the lakes. Uh, a great place to go if you search online, uh, I mentioned GLERL, uh, G-L-E-R-L, -E or the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. Uh, they have a, a, a number of great links and, and, and great repositories of data, some pictorials. Uh, some of it is uh, interactive. It's a wealth of information, and if you wanted to get into the details and, and kind of uh, study on your own or take a look at, uh, you know, validating what I've been telling you, you're certainly welcome to go and take a take a look there. Next slide. So wrapping up, and then I'll stick around to kind of ask for questions. Um, Want to let you folks know that uh, um, that uh, priorities of service dictate. Uh, how we dispatch our, our very small inventory of icebreakers. We work in partnership with our Canadian Coast Guard partners on the Great Lakes. Um, their two heavies help us balance our only one heavy. Um, and then if you look at the smaller breakers, we spread those out to, uh, to meet the, the smaller waterway needs at the same time, um, you know, again, trying to meet uh, our our mandate from executive order, which is protect the environment, meet uh, uh, the, uh, the, the reasonable demands of commerce, and at the same time uh, safeguard our, uh, our island communities uh, along those lines. So with that, I'll kind of uh, I'll, uh, shut up and, and kind of stand by for questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll give everybody a chance to enter some questions into the chat, which I can convey to Mark. And meanwhile, I will uh, highlight the status of our visitor centers at the moment. Um, the big news that we have is starting next week, the visitor center in Duluth is going to be offering outdoor services. So they'll have their tables set up outside, weather permitting. Thursday through Sundays from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And uh, they have their vessel arrival and departure announcements going on. There's a cell phone tour available outdoors. And there are some online options for their gift shop and virtual tours. At the Sulox Visitor Center, um, we are going to be uh, starting guest services and the hotline on May 9th. Uh, we are working on plans to open the interior of the visitor center. But, of course, that is going to depend on the status of uh, the Michigan's health uh, restrictions and uh, all of the federal guidelines. But one way or the other, we will have uh, boat schedules on the hotline again and uh, visitor assistance outdoors. And with that, I will look and see what we have for questions for Mark. Um, Miss Williams has a question there. She's asking about the uh, ice breaking capabilities of the Risley and the Griffin. And, and so the Risley. Uh, I'm going to put her up in the four foot range. So she's a twin screw, uh, twin propellered boat uh, with twin rudders, very, very maneuverable. Um, so I, I would say equivalent, maybe just a step slower and maybe a, a step uh, less maneuverable than the Mackinac, but every bit is capable. The Griffin, uh, not so much four. So I, I'm going to say she's probably good for about three feet of ice. Uh, I mentioned both of those platforms are better than 35 plus years old, and she's really struggled the last couple of years operating in what we call brash ice. Now, when you have plate ice, she's pretty good, but the brash ice is broken uh, plate ice that accumulates in depth and it grows, and sometimes that brash ice can get 15, 20 feet thick. And so it's like trying to drive through a daiquiri or a frozen smoothie. Um, and, and you really got to have a lot of horsepower to be able to push and displace that. And the Griffin, because she's uh, struggling uh, in her engineering plant, she's really having a challenge for that. So Risley about four feet, Griffin about three feet, but we got to be careful, like with our buoy tenders, where we put the Griffin. So I hope that answered that question. I had a question for you, Mark. I'm curious, what are the crew sizes on board some of these Coast Guard vessels? So Mackinac does it crew change are, in the season? 
Uh, so the, the crews stay the same year round. I mentioned Mackinac is a multi-mission capable vessel. So in the wintertime, she's an icebreaker. Summertime, she's a buoy tender. Uh, she also has a pollution response mission um, as well as a national defense mission. Uh, her crew, uh, roughly 50 uh, folks on board. Um, the buoy tenders, uh, maybe a little less, 45. Um, and then the uh, the bay class, the, the Katmai Bays, the 140-foot ice-breaking tugs, uh, they're at 18. Um, crews are mixed, so you have mixed-gendered crews. Um, so there's no limitation to who can serve. Um, in fact, uh, right now, the commanding officer of Mackinac, our first female commanding officer of Mackinac, um, Commander Kristen Seremgard, uh, she comes to us from the International Ice Patrol um, and just uh, went through her first winter. Um, we've had uh, a mix of, uh, of male, female commanding officers in all the other platforms. Um, Mackinac, relatively new, remember, she just, uh, just became uh, um, uh, commissioned in 2007. It took us a few years to develop a, a pool of commanding officers um, because they, you know, you got to grow them from inside the platform. And so it took a few years to do that. Uh, they service, generally they serve on board for about three years. Uh, the officer is a little less. The officer tour is generally two years. Um, so, you know, it takes a couple of generations to, to be able to build up your workforce. And, and so that's, uh, that's the deal there. And uh, Nicholas is uh, asking, he said he saw crew members walking on the ice off St. Joe Island, and it looked like they had a big kite. What were they doing? So um, the kite was part of a, a, an atmospheric present, uh, study. So the crew you saw on the ice, that was the ice rescue team. Uh, the kite they were flying, they were taking some atmospheric tests. Uh, we will periodically embark scientists on board this winter. We had folks from our own design uh, um, entity out of Washington, D.C., and our research and development center, which is in Groton, Connecticut. Uh, they are developing what is going to be the next generation of U.S. icebreakers for the Arctic. And uh, so we, it was a three-year project. We've had them out the last three years. This year, uh, they finally came in, and we did some uh, testing in the in the St. Mary's River. Uh, we spent uh, a week in February in the northern half of Green Bay, and then spent a week early March in the Straits of Mackinac, trying to find thicknesses that are equivalent to what the Arctic is. This year, we kind of struggled to do that. Um, normally, our plate thickness is uh, uh, mirror what is what's called first year ice in the Arctic. And uh, this year we didn't come close to that. So we were trying to do some atmospheric comparisons. And so what you probably saw was, uh, was them doing that. Uh, and uh, US Coast Guard crew rotate vessel assignments across the country. Do they have a choice? So um, yes, uh, yes and no. So we, uh, you, you do get some semblance. So the way the assignment process works is um, you're, you're, you have two categories of uh, personnel. You have officers and enlisted. Uh, I was uh, enlisted and then an officer later on in my career, so I can speak both ways. Uh, the enlisted, um, you have what is called a, an assignment list. And so you have, um, it's, it's basically a, a list of jobs that are gonna be open and you fill out what is called an electronic resume and you put from top to bottom, numbering one to however many, uh, your priorities or what you want to do. Then the needs of the service, there's an assignment officer in Washington that ultimately decides who goes where. Um, and, and so um, your performance, your behavior, uh, your skill set, all are built into that process. There's a panel that meets and determines who goes where. And then they produce what is called an assignment slate. The officers, um, much less... Um, um, much less in the way of, uh, of ask, you go where they need you to go. Um, there's a little bit of a selection process, so you get to put in your skill set and, and your resume is evaluated and your time and service and, and, and generally your promotion cycle goes into, in, into that effect. Um, but uh, enlisted uh, selection is, is a little broader and so you have a little bit more variety and, 
and you can do what they call homestead, which means you can stay in a general area and just go from location to location within that general area. And so there are folks here on the Great Lakes that never leave the Great Lakes. They'll go from Cleveland to Detroit, Detroit to the Sioux, the Sioux down to Milwaukee, and, and then repeat the process. Whereas from the, an officer assignment perspective, you want diversity in order to promote. Enlisted folks, you promote and you, your time-based promotions, you test and then you reach a time and then you promote. Officer ranks, um, a little bit challenging, you promote on merit and it's not an automatic. Uh, your fields of promotion are, are, are smaller, uh, so it's not 100% go up and, and get promoted. Sometimes the assignment uh, or the promotion pools are small, seven out of 10 get through. Uh, as you get more senior, smaller and smaller. So maybe when you go to go through uh, your your commander rank or your captain's ranks, your selection process is down to 30 percent. And, and so it's very competitive. And, and so you have a certain amount of time to do a certain amount of things to pad your resume, to present yourself for senior leadership positions. And, and so it becomes very challenging. And so you want to be very selective and careful about where you go. You could go to, you know, say I want to I'm from. I, originally, I'm from Washington, D.C., and if I want to work in Washington, D.C., that's where our Coast Guard headquarters is. I could have stayed in Washington, D.C. Uh, my whole military career, but from a promotion standpoint, it's not very diverse, uh, and the skill sets aren't diverse, and so you uh, shorten yourself on promotions. So um, you have to be careful about what you ask for. So uh, I hope that answers that. So choice, yes. Now, if uh, an officer ends up on like a, the Mackinac, are they going to be kind of then funneled towards ice breaking forever? Or are they still going to be able to end up in some nice warm assignments? So diversity of mission. So I'll use myself as an example. Um, I spent early part of my career as an electronics technician. And so I was assigned to the Coast Guard's larger fleet of vessels. Uh, our coastal vessels, uh, 400 foot and, and greater, who worked the Caribbean, overseas, the uh, Atlantic and Pacific fleets. About midway through that, I um, was selected for officer candidate school and I went to the officer side of the house. And from a ship driving standpoint, the smaller the platform, the more time you get to handle the vessel. Um, and, and so I started out on buoy tenders and then went to icebreakers and then graduated into an icebreaker buoy tender hybrid. Mackinac is an icebreaker buoy tender hybrid. So if you start out there as a junior officer, um, you have selection opportunities. One, you got to do well on board the ship. Um, you're, you're, you're evaluated and you're scored. And as long as you perform well, later on down the line, you will have opportunities to be selected for uh, what we call cadre leadership positions. So you might be the number three officer or the number two officer or the commanding officer, which is uh, the master of the vessel per se. And, and so um, you're not necessarily pigeonholed into icebreakers. Um, you have the opportunity, and normally there's a seashore rotation. And for junior officers, we want our officers to go to graduate school as well. And so you might, early in your career, you'll spend two years aboard ship, and then you'll spend three years ashore. If you don't do your graduate program on that time frame, the Coast Guard sometimes will select you and pay for you to go to school. And then you got to do a payback in whatever uh, uh, whatever study area. So let's say I go and get an MBA, uh, master's in, in in business. I, I might uh, go back and uh, um, and have to do you know three years in headquarters, work in the Coast Guard's budget, or or if I study uh, uh, national defense, I might have to go and uh, do a tour of duty with the Navy in the national defense realm or in the Pentagon. So it depends on where your, your, your skills lie, what your graduate study goes into. Um, myself, I, my, my degree was in, uh, in education. And uh, so outside of the Coast Guard Academy, which I had no desire to go to, um, I ended up just being able to jump from ship to ship to ship, and it worked out for me. So it depends. Uh, we're a small service organization, uh, 35,000 total. There are more New York City police officers than there are in the entire you know, officer enlisted core of the Coast Guard. So just kind of give you a sense for scale and size. So you have some flexibility, but at the same time, you got to be careful because you can get pigeonholed and then you shortchange yourself. So I'm going to follow up and ask, what was your favorite assignment in the Coast Guard while you were active duty? 
I, I'll have to say my last tour of duty was an icebreaker out of Detroit, um, the Bristol Bay. We were a hybrid, so we worked. We had a, a, a barge um, that we would push. Uh, in the summertime, we worked buoys, and in the wintertime, we would leave the barge in Detroit, and we would travel the Great Lakes working icebreakers. Um, small crew. Uh, the hybrid had uh, 26 crew members. Um, and so as a, you know, a cadre position, a leadership position on board that vessel, uh, you, you basically got the best of wor both worlds, working buoys, uh, which for me was, uh, you know, I did the law enforcement stuff and the, the, the migrant interdiction stuff in my early career down in the Caribbean, uh, both in the C Cuban migration crisis in the early 80s. I'm going to date myself because I came in in 81. Um, but uh, we had the Cuban migration, and then we had the Haitian migration, and then we had the big drug interdictions, late 80s, early 90s. And so I spent most of my time in a law enforcement mission. Long, slow days looking for targets of opportunity and, and, and not a lot of closure when it comes to the mission because you'd, you'd make an arrest or at sea or you transfer the cargo that you would arrest, personnel or drugs. You transfer that to you know another entity like DEA or or uh, ATF or, or immigration, and you never got to see closure on the mission. Aids to navigation, each day you went out, we're going to work this buoy, that buoy, this light, that light. Uh, and so the end of each day, hard work, very detailed work, uh, but you got to see closure on that. And so combine that mission with, uh, with ice breaking, which was you get paid to hit stuff, which was cool. Um, I, I have to say that uh, that was my favorite out of, out of my 40 plus year career. I don't mind do what I do now. I miss being at sea every now and again. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is my 21st winter in the Great Lakes, three aboard ship and 19 here uh, in this particular uh, capacity. Um, so I, I have to say I, I enjoy this mission, but my favorite overall was uh, was working out of Detroit. Oh, somebody wants to put you on the spot about which is the best Mackinac. It, it, so I get this question a lot. It, so old versus new. Uh, I, and I'm going to cop out and I'm going to say um, they, they both had their benefits. But if forced to pick one over the other, I would take new Mackinac over old Mackinac. And here's why. Old Mackinac was, was very specific. It had a very specific mission. And that was Great Lakes ice breaking. But she didn't have any mission the rest of the year. And so if you think back, we, we spend uh, four months out of the year breaking ice. So eight months out of the year, Mackinac was basically touring the Great Lakes festivals, and she didn't really contribute all that much. New Mackinac, um, New Mackinac is uh, multi-mission. So she has, uh, uh, I mentioned the AIDS and navigation mission. She has an ice breaking mission. She's got a law enforcement mission, a national defense mission, but that environmental response mission, um, what she can do, she has a, a, a skimming system on board. Normally, when you have a spill at sea, we're deploying boom, and then we've got to bring in all this barge equipment and stuff uh, to come in and collect that, uh, that stuff. The Great Lakes, as you know, is uh, environmentally sensitive. Um, most of the folks are aware that we have a pipeline that, that tra transits uh, the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, that pipeline is old. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a ship drag an anchor across and snap a couple cable lines and actually dent that pipeline. And, and so we drink this water here. We rely on this water here. Um, and so we have to protect that. And, and so New Mackinac offers a, 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 a oil recovery system that we've never had on the Great Lakes before. And, and so I, I have to choose her over the old because of that. And then John is asking, will future ice-breaking ships use the azimuth drive also? So that's, a, that's an interesting study um, that's going on right now. The Arctic are really interested in that. If you look at the, the experts in the Arctic, the Norwegians, uh, the Russian ships are, are uh, their Z-drive, their nuclear-powered Z-drives or azimuth drives, and, and so the science is trending in that direction. Here's the problem for the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard. They're expensive to maintain. Mackinac's Azipod, each one, when you drop one for maintenance, which you do typically two times a year, it's a million dollars just to drop it. That's before you even turn a wrench to it. So it, they're very expensive to maintain. And, and so when you look at the benefit of maneuverability, um, ice breaking, especially in the Arctic, 
it's a contact sport. It's horsepower. You're driving in straight lines. You want some maneuverability, but generally you're talking about vast areas in straight lines with a little bit of back and fill to kind of pick up ships that get stuck behind you. Um, the Arctic Breaker, do we really need that kind of precision? And that's what we're studying right now. Um, the Mackinac is general, is, it, she's highly maneuverable. Um, she's very capable, but she's a spaceship. And, and it takes a, a, a great deal of expertise, uh, both satellite sensors, electronic sensors, uh, the drive plant that operates her. Um, it's precision equipment. And precision and slamming around in ice don't go together. The shock absorption, you can imagine being on, uh, you know, on board an icebreaker, you're shaking fillings loose uh, when you're doing that world of work. And even as, as technically advanced as Mackinac is, she's still steel raking across, uh, you know, hard packed ice. And that has a wear and tear. And, and so um, she's been in place now going on, uh, well, 14 years. This is her 14th season. Um, and, and we've learned some things about the technology. Um, you know, my humble opinion, um, I, I, the, the cost of maintenance doesn't outweigh the gain. And, and so when, when asked for my opinion and periodically it comes to me, um, you know, I'm an old school person that says, hey, you know, the, there's something to the maneuverability that would get on twin shaft with a high horsepower uh, and, and a big, wide, long, uh, you know, square boat. And so that, that's to me, you know, the designers, the engineers, the, the program folks in Washington that are studying that, they've collected our local input. They've come here and looked at Mackinac, but they've also studied her for the last 14 years. And, and so we'll see what that happens. But Z drives are up and coming, and the folks are anxious to get to that. Okay. Um, while we wait and see if there are a couple more questions, I'm going to um, highlight again. Uh, we're going to have another program in, on May 6th. And it's going to be looking into some of the backstories of uh, how the vessels got their names. And then I'm going to uh, load this up in case anyone needs any of those links. I will post the link to the survey and the YouTube channel in the chat in a minute. And Angie had another question. And she's asking if you see nuclear-powered vessels coming to the Great Lakes or the U.S. icebreaking fleet in the Arctic. Uh my, my quick answer is no to the Great Lakes and no to the Arctic Fleet. Um, I will say that in the Arctic Fleet, uh, the, Russian, the Russians and the Chinese, uh, increasingly Chinese presence in the Arctic, which is why the United States and Canada are such focused on this national strategic initiative. Um, you know, you got folks on the Great Lakes that are arguing for Great Lakes icebreakers and icebreaking capacity. But when it comes to the national defense of the Northern Hemisphere, North America, Canada and the United States as a, as a whole are really focused on the Arctic. And that's because uh, our, our Russian and Chinese folks are, are, are deploying larger and greater uh, platforms to that area. And, and look, the economic significance of the Arctic um, from, from point A to point B if you look at movement of cargo and the movement of commodities, it's expensive and it takes a long time to use the Panama Canal. And when you're building bigger and bigger ships for containerized cargoes, um, you're, they're looking for a short way. And, and let's face it, the Arctic is that short way. Uh, you're seeing that with air travel. You're seeing that with ship travel now, too. And, and so uh, their presence up there means that we've got to beef up our presence up there in order to maintain uh, you know, a national defense posture. Uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear capabilities aboard ships, it's not new. Um, the U.S. aircraft carriers have nuclear carriers. Um, it is an efficient uh, means of propulsion. Uh, many of our submarines are nuclear powered. Uh, but from a cost standpoint, uh, nuclear propulsion for the Coast Guard, it's just outside of our realm of possibilities. And so I just don't see that. And I certainly don't see it coming to the Great Lakes. Thank you. I think that wraps up most of our questions. We had lots of positive uh, comments and thanking you for a great presentation. I'm going to add my thanks to that as well. It's my pleasure. Look, I, I, I want to uh, thank you to uh, Ms. Briggs for, for setting this up. Uh, for those who took time out of their day to come and, and kind of see what we do here, um, we, uh, 
we, we take this mission very, uh, uh, very seriously. Um, it is, uh, it's management of personalities. And I, there was a, somebody was commenting, lived on an island or supported an island that we have in our area. Um, you know, you're dealing with people, but you're also dealing with lives. And, and so we take that very seriously. And, and the icebreaking mission is just one of those offshoot uh, missions that uh, the Coast Guard takes very seriously. And so uh, myself, I come from very humble beginnings. Um, and uh, the Coast Guard has meant a lot to me and, and my family. Um, and so the opportunity for me to be able to give back uh, and, and contribute is uh, uh, is a good thing for me personally. So uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to come and pay attention and, and uh, give us the, the support. And, and so I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Briggs, and I uh, wish all you right. all a good day. Thanks. Thank you. And again, uh, we'll be back on May 6th okay. with a program about uh, the, the namesakes of the, uh, some of our favorite vessels on the Great Lakes.